Life does have a strange way of surprising you in the most unexpected place and at an unexpectedly regular hour. That was me, Grace, a paramedic of 30 years who genuinely believed in saving lives and had an uncanny ability to find myself up shit creek without a paddle. By and large, my life was just running from crisis to crisis with no time for anything else. Show more show, less I never would have guessed that a broken down car would lead me to the love of my life. It was a blazing hot July afternoon, and I had broken down on the side of the road, staring at my car like if I looked hard enough, she would suck all that smoke back in. And that was when he appeared. Ryan, all smiley charm and hands, made for beer mugs rather than spanners. Need a hand? Can I talk to you, Grace? He approached me full of swagger that didn't quite match his casual attire. I must have sounded a mess. My hair was plastered to this forehead, making it look more like paper mesh, and I would later discover the expression on that fessamund grim. Stromberg. Well, unless you're Jesus freaking Christ, I seriously doubt that. This piece of crap hates me. I retorted, a lot more because of frustration on my day than anything actually mad at him. Ryan laughed deeply, a sound that brought my eyes back to him. Maybe we should hold off on the exorcists. I'm pretty handy with cars. Let's see what we've got. Ryan rolled up his sleeves and set to it, shocking, mostly in a good way. The certainty with which his hands worked was almost hypnotic, and I found myself wishing that he wouldn't be finished fixing it too soon. Emerging from under the hood, he said looks like your coolant hose decided to call it quits I'm able to patch it enough so you can get to a shop that's all. Um, thank you. Sorry almost feels wrong too. I'm Grace, by the way. To which he replied with a grin shaking my hand. Ryan, and don't worry about it. Well, I can't very well leave a damsel in distress on the side of road now, could I? We got to chatting as he worked on my car. We talked like we had grown up together. He talked about being an electrician at work, his current project in the basement, and I shared stories of my ambulance adventures. With each new conversation I had with him, the more it became apparent to me that this feeling was one that I never wanted to go away. Ryan announced, all done, as he put the finishing twist on his wrench. She ought to wait for you at the shop. I could not keep the disappointment from leaking out of my voice. Thank you, Ryan. How can I ever in this life repay you? His face never lost that infinite smile as he wiped his hands on a rack. How about dinner? I know a guy who makes the best hamburgers in town. My heart raced. Did you just ask me out? Do you treat all women this way when they first meet? I teased over trying to hide my enthusiasm. Just the ones that look like if they eat a burger with someone, it wouldn't be out of place. He quipped back playfully as his eyes sparkled in mischief. And just like that, I was nodding and agreeing to dinner with a man who had turned one of my worst days ever into a day, which could never be forgotten for all it meant. It only seemed right to move in with Ryan's mom after we said, I do. My folks died long ago. I found a family I never thought even existed in the big kind of cozy house. Harriet, Ryan's mom, was a sweetheart. She was fond of me as if I were her own daughter and our relationship grew stronger. We would sit for hours sipping coffee sharing recipes and supporting one another through the valleys and mountain tops of life. So, it was comforting you know having bonding once again. Into this new life, two years later, our little boy Mason was born to Ryan and I. He brought joy that I could not articulate, but also a dose of reality. I resigned from being a paramedic and chose to be at home, focus on our son, keep the house. Ryan went on with his electrician work at those major projects for the government, and all he did was talk about them. Wires, gears, stuff I really had no clue away from. They sat for hours, waiting on nothing, but as days all began to blend together into a whirlwind of diapers and baby giggles at family dinners. One evening, we were about to have dinner and for whatever reason, 
Ryan blew it. Brace, we need to talk. He began and his voice was strung tighter than a lid on a jar of pickles. Go ahead, I said, waiting for the other shoe to drop. From how he said it, I knew this was not going to be a call me with weather complaints conversation. About all this, he said, gesturing with his fork at the house that surrounded him. Our life. Me? It might be time to return to work, don't you think you're losing yourself here? Hot anger flared inside me at his words. Losing myself. I'm raising our son Ryan and keeping your home. That's not nothing. He let out a long sanging sigh that grated on my last nerve. That's not what I mean, Liz. You're more than this. What about your license? What about your entire life? You used to save lives. Had I not heard correctly? The hell like I am guess now, I'm some joyless housewife grace is that it? No, that. He cut himself off, combining elements of both foolish pride and the need to prove him wrong. I began exploring options for re-entering the world medical field on a part-time basis. I managed to juggle home life and trying and failing desperately for my own thing, but I was a go. On uppers, Ryan can add all this together. The job searches that only happen after midnight and phone calls deep into his kid's nap time. One day, he said, see, I knew. You could do it with an air of told you so smugness that made me want to launch a cushion at him. What you seem to think, Ryan. I only said, that balance thing. So much more is implied my old life was less significant. Once we connected the dots between Ryan when I somewhat at part-timed and Mason walking playgroup or was he nearly one. It seemed he was there more than home during those years, stacking his work trips like pancakes. He never at home, it was always some kind of unsettling, ominous storm brewing in the distance. It was no longer a home, but an airfield where the pull between us could almost be seen and walked through. Ryan was fluent in disapproval behind poor spaghetti, improper chewing and wordy words encoded through my physical form itself all the way down to our child-rearing ways. What is this? Grace. As soon as he would enter the door, his glare flickered across our guest room in search of something to criticize. And it didn't take long. And why is Mason still up? He should be in bed. Oh my God, I tried to play nice and keep it cool, but... Nope. I would reply, my words briefless and exhausted by the monotonous cycle of being alive for him. Really trying Ryan, drags on so long because Mason will not go to bed without you. He, he misses his dad. Ryan always had a clever, biting reply. Parent, all of your bottom... If you miss me or not, you should be the one making that call, not him. Don't worry, Harriet said kindly as I walked in the door. Ryan's just gone to the toilet while trying instead of using it properly. I wanted to believe that way, too, but there were times I still thought our miraculously healing marriage hung by a single worn thread. Harriet was that, yet another bright-eyed, healthy toddler except she wasn't. A phone call came when Ryan was away on his zillionth business trip. What he said when I told him his mom was no good dropped my jaw. Can't you, Grace? He was clearly frustrated with what I did and said, You are the medic. N.E. Well, I have stuff to do over here. What he told me I honestly could not believe. It's your mom, Ryan. She's really sick. Match Sue repairer. Minor nothing fix this is, but seeing that he wasn't supporting, I did what had to be done. I drove her to the vet emergency, thinking that it might just be something small, nil irreversible. But oh, what a fool fate is. There it was. The curse word of our vocabulary. Inoperable brain tumor. My heart sank. There was too much energy in Harriet to allow the decent into a pal. Harriet kept getting worse and I felt like a circus performer with twenty spinning plates. Keeping an eye on her, keeping the house under control, bringing up Mason, it nearly did me in. Ryan, however, was nowhere to be seen throughout it all. He had lost interest in his mom's health. After a while, Harriet's care was too much to handle all on my own. I called and sent her to a nursing home. Mason came with me every chance I had to see her. It was bittersweet to visit her there. 
But Harriet, bless her heart mothered, the lot of us maintain an open hearth. One of the last times we came to see her, she clasped my supportive hand in yours and gazed at me with sorrowful sadness. Thankful. Thank you and goodbye, Grace. Paul, she started to say so quietly nearly a breath itself. I am sorry for what egg. I mean how he ended up. Harriet, don't. That is not your mistake. My voice catching halfway. She only smiled, and it was a tired smile. You'll see, dear. Hey there. I have surprise in store for you. She replied that didn't reveal more. Then Harriet died soon after. The last drop was at his own mom's funeral when Ryan never turned up. I was the one who had set it all up. I was now standing by her headstone saying goodbye to a woman that has become closer than family ever would be for me from my husband. My world came crashing down around 2 a.m. when the squeal of the front door hitting our wall woke me from my slumber. My heart was pounding in my chest when I saw Ryan make his way into the room not by himself, but with a woman wrapped around him like some sort of human leech and she had enough smug wrapped up within her smile that it practically melted under how dimly lit the club happened to be. Grace, get up. Ryan slurred, his words sticky with alcohol. We gotta talk. I blinked away the sleep and tried to make sense of this vision in front of me. Ryan, who's this? What's going on? This, he gestured to the woman at his side, is Erica. She's going to be my wife. Get your things and go. The room spun. Leave. It's Ryan. In the middle of the night past runtime. What shall I do with Mason now? My voice a mixture of disbelief and rising panic. I somehow managed to stammer. But Ryan's face was stone cold. Not my problem. Now, I've been waiting for the perfect time and this is it. I'm done with you. I scrambled around for my phone and hit record, ideas percolating in my brain. Dom with me. Seriously. Ryan, what the hell? Why we have to leave home? He snorted as a bitter and very cold breathy laugh emitted from him. Our home. No, no, it's my house now. Erica's and mine. We all work together and have fun on the job. Wait till you see how we play when nobody is watching. Erica, who was already scouting around like she owned the place, didn't bother to hide her triumph. You hurt him. Time to go. I resisted the urge to crumble. And Mason, what about your son? It had been indifference that was the most painful, simply shrugged away like Ryan said. He can go with you. Doesn't matter to me. Erica, and our kids. And I needed to be reminded of those words, oh how I did as I just stood there disbelief and anger fighting with one another within me. I called it up from inside and set my voice, then looked them all in the eyes for once and said, Ock, Ryan, I'm leaving but it ain't over. I gathered a few things in my arms, ran back to the room and scooped up Mason, so he was wrapped tight with his blanket. I turned my head to the stranger in bed with me, got up and walked out into a cold night feeling completely different from what that warm duvet provided. I did not sleep that night after Ryan turned our world upside down. The hotel room was dark and quiet. Mason lay sleeping beside me, completely oblivious to the maelstrom that ravaged it from within and without. I was terrified. I had hundreds of thousands or even a million thoughts and fears and plans racing through my head. What next? I did not even know how it picked up the pieces of a life that completely smashed in one second put down my hardly working cell drawn with a purpose unsaturated. I phoned an employee of Ryan's who we all knew, a mutual friend, Lisa. We walked over to our friend's house and I realized that if anybody could relate as to how much this had turned me into a monster, it was her. I gasped out loud, I whispered as much as my voice could whisper and not wake him up. Um, it is me, and half the frog-like human in my throat excited out of mouth follows silence. Grace, what's up? It's late. Is everything okay? The drowsiness dissipated just like that, and Lisa sounded worried. No, everything's not okay. Ryan, he fucking threw us out in the middle of the night. He's got someone else. Lisa, he goes, Michael. She works stun slash me, and she is going to be his wife. The words just came out, crashing one after the other. 
each word confirming what a cruel nightmare I was living. What? Slow down, Grace. He did what? Lisa suddenly sounded incensed and surprised as the adrenaline kicked in. I took a deep breath and tried to keep calm. He brought her home. Lisa told me to pack my things and go. And I've got it all on audio. I recorded the conversation. You did what? Grace that? Why yes, Grace. Brilliant. Send it to me. We'll figure this out, okay? Don't worry. There was relief to see and hear Lisa propping him up. I sent her the audio recording, that digital record of Ryan's perfidy. And so we discussed plans, talked next steps, anything to give me an inch of relief in the darkness that surrounded me. The hotel room curtains were only somewhat muting the first rays of dawn when my phone came to life with a buzz. The number was unknown and for a moment I hesitated. My life had been rocked to the foundations, and part of me was almost surprised I did not hear further news. Hello. I was careful with my words and ready for whatever she may say. Is this Grace? It was a voice I didn't know, but it had the warmth of someone familiar. Yes, speaking. Who's this? My name's John Fisher. I'm a lawyer. Well, I represented Harriet and you are the son-in-law. Harriet. Even the sound of her name packed an emotional punch. Yes, I... I know Harriet. How can I help you? Not how you can help me, but how I got you Harriet left you something. It's important. Can we meet today? I was taken aback. Harriet had thought of me. So soon after what had gone on. Yes, of course. When and where? We set a time to meet at his office that morning. George was the one who ended up helping me get Mason prepared, and all of my thoughts running wild on where this version would lead to. What in the world could Harriet have left for me? Henderson's office was my bastion of peace amongst the storm that had become life. He smiled kindly at me, gesturing next to him towards a room with two chairs and an end table. Thanks for being here, Grace. As I recall, Harriet said great things about you. She wanted to make sure you and Mason were provided for. I nodded, still in a daze. What did she leave? Paul handed me an envelope. There was a letter in Harriet's hand. It was her spilling out on paper, thanking me for all the love and care I gave to her, apologizing through sobs that Ryan had done this, telling me she wishes nothing but my best in life. And that's when Mr. Henderson dropped the revelation. Grace Harriet left you the house, then the house and nearly all of her savings. I was speechless. More than she could bear was the truth of Harriet's ability. She had thrown me a life preserver, one last time to make things right with my life. Is this even legal? Now can she just strike all of Ryan? I choked, barely daring to get the words out. Mr. Henderson nodded firmly. Harriet made it clear and took legal measures to protect herself. The house is yours, Grace, and there's enough in savings for you to get a fresh start. During that call, I cried. Words of thanks poured out of me forcefully through my relief tears. Even in her death throes, Harriet must have seen me Mason. She had shown us there was a reason to live on, given hope in times when we thought all this lost. Less than twenty-four hours from the moment my phone was ringing with excitement over my shoulder load weighed into Mr. Henderson's office, it buzzed again, but this time it was Ryan. His voice was the epitome of a storm, all wind and bluster. Grace, get your ass to Henderson's office now. He roared through the phone. And that would be what his face looked like. I imagined it as all red and purple with rage. Taking a deep breath, knowing that was unlikely to be the case, I turned and walked back to the lawyer with Mason close behind me. It was supercharged with emotion, Ryan and his new bird were already there, circling backwards like two caged animals. Ryan had me the second I walked in and was waving a bunch of papers around like he thought they might catch fire. What's this crap about? Why the hell did my mom left everything to you? Jeff Henderson, always the voice of reason among us storm chasers, stepped in. Come on people, let's talk about this like the rational folks we all are. Unfortunately, rationality had left low building. Erica eyed the door jealously like it was her way out of here, a realization dawning over that once smug exterior. The contents of the garage, Ryan, 
that was your mother's legacy to you, I gathered after some effort. She left the rest to Mason and me. Ryan's face twisted as Arctic Alley, if that was possible, into a snarl of disbelief and fury. The garage? What do you want me to do with it? Put it in the trash. Mr. Henderson gave Ryan another document, a letter from Harriet. Your mother had her reasons, Ryan. She wished you could get it one day. Ryan quickly read the letter, and I could see his anger ebb away to a simmering sulk. This, this is, seeing the writing on the wall, his mistress finally snapped. Go get your brooding soul sacrificed. I kind of have things to do other than languish for eternity on some worthless piece of rock. I did not sign up for that shit, to be with a loser. And she was gone, exciting as dramatically as burst into and became part of our lives. Ryan was now utterly alone, and he vented his anger entirely upon us. You'll pay for this. I'll sue. I'll. Unflappable as always, Mr. Henderson cut in. You shouldn't do that, Ryan. You are not going to win, and it will only be a waste of your time and money. The room was so quiet, he could only hear the heavy breathing of everyone in it. With no other options, Ryan dejectedly slouched out of the office while leaving a mess in his wake. When the storm had passed, and my life was turned on its head in more ways than I can even remember, backwards then forwards, before back around, there stood among what used to be some sort of a world. Me. The parties in the divorce were divided with Ryan fighting over everything, but especially Harriet's land. He had the damnedest time believing actions took responsibility. You couldn't get back love and trust after breaking without plumbing a judge. One of the final times I saw Ryan in his delivery parking lot visits, before he was removed from our case, anger and confusion laced his words as he asked me, I just don't understand, Grace. Why are you doing this? What kind of shitty world does this live in where things couldn't just be the way that they were? I scanned his face, really looked at it, and recognized the man I once adored beyond measure. Ryan, you broke us, but you cannot find your way back to a family. Harriet could see it even if you did not. Just as Mr. Henderson had predicted, he could not even be successful in his attempts to get Harriet's stuff for her fans. His motives were seen through by the judge, and for once justice felt like it had actually been served. The house went to me and Mason, Plus, Ryan had to pay alimony. It made me realize that what began as a plea for help in the audio recording of that night I shared with Lisa had developed into more. As happens with these things, it spread and before too long, Ryan's acts were revealed to all. A promising career for a while fell hanging upon his own wrongdoings. It was only after that same punishment, but with new reports to use them on, and working in a reduced capacity at another branch of the service. Nor did his lady friend, Erica. She was ensnared by the vortex of her own devising and dismissed for bad behavior. The workplace, as it happened, was not the appropriate setting for their games. A different constriction company had a slice of cash involved, too. Another physical reminder to her that it was over. I took comfort in the little things that could distract me, Laughing with my son, being in our home, the comfort of friends and family. It was not an easier journey, and there were days when I felt the weight of all this too heavy to carry. And in those moments, I remembered the strength that had emerged, a resolve to fight for myself and fight for Mason, fucking kicking down doors so we could walk into some space where maybe things would be slightly better there was one rabbit hole of hope available. In my time as a paramedic, I have learned to understand just how much is the line between them so thin. And yet, throughout this process a light bulb went off in my head, and I reached for a dream that seemed to be beyond reach after all. That dream is now a real possibility, thanks to the inheritance Harriet left us. I only made it to school as a doctor. Balancing school, Mason and working is hard, but we are managing. There are lots of benefits to living in the house that Harriet left us. It is like a constant reminder of her love and faith in us. I swear, Mason is almost out of toddlerhood, and I am getting an increasingly clearer daily picture of the person he will become. It is my mission to show him that his father lacked strength, kindness, intelligence and humility as courage, but still has everything. 
I have never spoken ill of Ryan to Mason. They are as smart or smarter than we give them credit for. The void left by Ryan has been a quiet parable. He has taken even less interest in her, and really, that's a blessing. One night, after I put Mason to bed and cracked open the books, he walked out of his room, brow furrowed. Why does Dad not want to see me, Mom? It was the question I had been dreading, but luckily for me, I knew the answer. I sat him down and tried to ease into my words. Mason, sometimes people do things that we just can't understand. It's about yourself and value of yours. Those are the decisions of your dad. He nodded, processing this. I know. I only wish he cared more, you know? My heart broke for him as I embraced him. I know, kiddo. But you have me, and I've got you. One minute to me, but I gotta go love ten families you also have an army of people who love you. A tiny fraction of the pressure was lifted from his slightly older shoulders and Mason smiled. Yeah, I'm lucky, huh? You bet, I told him as I tucked him in. Right, now, let's get some rest. We have an early day tomorrow. The determination that I felt when I went back to my studies. My journey was not just about me but for Mason and our future. Suddenly, being a doctor was no longer just about fulfilling a distant dream. It was now his way out of the street violence and chronic poverty in San Diego, California. You can succeed. Perhaps Ryan choosing to keep his distance was a blessing in disguise. It gave me and Mason a chance to start a life free of the weight his decisions cast. We could grow, we could heal, and life became infused with the magic that lays in every ritual.